afraid step by take I take it you you are my way Jesus every breath I take I breathe in you
sing that bridge one more time, then we're going to move on. Yeah. This song comes from, well, bless him, Lord. This song comes from the Psalms. I can't remember exactly the one, but it talks about how the writer's saying, man, everybody's doing good but me, and I'm pitiful, and the whole world's going down the tubes kind of thing. How many have ever been there? How many stayed a night or two there? Everything's going down. It's all looking bad, and why is it that everybody who's living like the devil is doing so well, and I'm trying to serve the Lord, and everything's falling apart? Everybody ever been there? Yeah, I've, I've, I've known that pity thing before, too. But I love the last few verses of this psalm because he said, Till I entered the house of the Lord, then I knew what their end was. Then I knew what was going to happen. It may look good now, but I know what the end is. And guys, I know what the end of us is going to be if we follow after Jesus. So, if you're here tonight, and you are, and you have been beat up by ministry, or you've been beat up by somebody or mistreated in church, and you're singing that song of how pitiful things are, and you're just trying to be a little righteous soul, and everybody hates you, and they've been biting you, and doing you dirty, and all that kind of stuff, just realize that every fella you see up here on this platform that will grab this mic tonight, one day felt the same exact way. You see, when I sing, I almost lost my way. It's nothing truer than that. But till one day in April of 95, the Lord let his glory come on me fresh and renewed my spirit that was dry and thirsty. And he's going to do the same for you tonight. My foot had almost slipped. Oh, Lord. You see, I almost lost my way. song is about mercy, and mercy is undeserved forgiveness, and God's going to forgive you tonight, friend. There are some people in this room tonight that you believe that you've done things so wrong that God won't forgive you. I have never, in my short time in the ministry, I've been working for the Lord for 21 years, but I have never seen such mercy and such, and you know when you've been forgiven. You can see, you can feel it, you can know... I've never seen anything like it. So whatever you've done, and we've had crimes confessed. We've had, you name it, friend, just about. We've had it confessed here at these altars. People getting right with God. And the twinkle in their eye, the joy. God's going to forgive you, friend. He'll wash you clean. Those of you at home, he will forgive you. Glory.
your heart out. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> yeah. Y'all know, y'all know what you get when you back mask country music. You'll sober up, your dog will come home, your wife will quit running around. <laughs> yeah, your pickup truck will start too. <laughs> y'all may be seated. <laughs> hey, Lord. I'll tell you, I'm having fun tonight. Praise God. Woo. Glory to God. I'll tell you, I just feel like hollering real loud. Yes, Lord! Hey! Whoa! Somebody might wonder, why in the world would you want to do that? Well, I don't know. Why do you want to do some of the dumb things you do? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel good. I just feel great, as a matter of fact. Hallelujah. You know, there's a big debate going back and forth about what revival looks like and, uh, and so forth. And uh, I, I, I'll tell you one thing. I don't think any of us really know what it looks like. None of us haven't seen one. <laughs> if this is not one, then I don't know what one looks like. I really don't. All I know is this, that uh, uh, June the 24th, the second Sunday night of this revival, I came in and sat down over there, and I'd been in the ministry at that time 38 years, and uh, I knew how to do ministry. I'd been through college and seminary, and uh, even went through the Naval War College up at Newport, Rhode Island at that point in time. I knew how to do things, organize things, and do things, and I was a professional but I was cold and dry in my spirit, and I knew that there was no power in my life. I'm just telling you the way it is. I was, I was pastoring a nice church, had men on staff, a district official in a, in a district of the Assemblies of God, and everything looked good on the surface, but friend, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. It wasn't good because God was not showing up in the supernatural. It wasn't any sin involved or anything like that. You know, it wasn't any gross immorality or anything like that. It was just high and dry and uh, trying to make it happen on one's own. And through methodology and through things that you'd been taught and, th and things that you'd learned. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, it just wasn't happening. And I came in and sat down over there, and I didn't understand everything that was going on. In fact... I, I was looking for pastor. I thought, sure, he'd stop it because I'd known him, you know, and he didn't put up with any foolishness in church. And, and I started looking for him, and he was draped over this control panel back here. <laughs> and uh, I'd known him for a number of years at that time. And, and uh, I said to my wife, I said, he ain't no, going to be no help. <laughs> but I knew God was in here. Steve Hill was running up and down this platform like a wild man. And uh, there was no way I was going to let him pray for me. I'll tell you right now. I didn't know him. And he had that look in his eye that I wasn't sure whether he was with us or not with us. And I was somewhat nervous, like some of you. But I knew that somehow that God was in this place and things were happening here that I hadn't seen happen in 38 years of ministry at that time. And I knew that it was exciting, and I knew that, and I was seeing lives changed, and I sat and watched for a little while. And I want you to know that God got a hold of my heart, friend, and I'm not the same person I was two years ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know whether this is a revival or not. I have a sneaking suspicion that it is. I mean, deep down inside, I've just got this, uh, this premonition that we're in the middle of something good and something big, and it's going to get better and bigger. 
But I, I, you know, I, I don't know, but I do know this. I know what happened to me. You can argue about anything you want to argue about, but you can't tell me what didn't happen to me. I know where I was, and I know where I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is sort of like puppy love. You know, people say puppy love's not real. Well, it's real to the puppies. And I want you to know this is real to me. It may not be real to anybody else, but it's real to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I don't know how much longer, how much longer in ministry I've got, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going back to what I was. Hallelujah. It may be me in my living room and my wife as the audience, but that's the way it's going to be. I ain't going back to what I was. And those cold, stale, dead, dry, philosophical, theological presentations that would absolutely put the dead to sleep. Hallelujah. If this is not revival, bless God, we'll just continue doing what we're doing until revival gets here. And then when it gets here, we'll have revival in this too. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't preached lately. I'm going tomorrow to begin four days of preaching, and I can't wait. I'm starting tonight, as you can tell. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's wonderful, absolutely marvelous. I'm supposed to be up here to receive an offering. That's what I'm really here for. And that's what I'm going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next to preaching and eating chicken offerings, the next thing I like to do best. And I'm going to tell you, friends, we need a good offering tonight. Hallelujah. We don't make an issue of money here, but I'm going to tell you, it takes money to make a revival go. Wow. Well, what brings a preacher to Brownsville? Stand up here and talk to me. Come here, brother. Stand up here and talk to me. What brings a preacher to Brownsville? Where are you from? Right here. Pensacola. You're, are you really? Yes. <laughs> well, what's your name? Louis Spivey. Louis Spivey. God bless Louis you, man. Fellowship. I was in the first two pastors' conference you had. Didn't know about this last one you had last week. Yeah. But I'll be here in November. Well, God bless you. It's good to have you, Brother Spivey. Yeah, every chance I get, I come. Yeah. What do you think about revival? Well, if it's not, it's not going to be. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Good. What's your name, man? Kevin Bishop. I heard your voice out there a while ago when you was worshiping. I said, well, if I just had a voice like that. <laughs> if you had a voice like mine, you might not. <laughs> well. Uh, where are you from? Uh. Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Man, I'd have thought you was from the South. No, I'm from Ohio. What? Do you pastor? Yes, sir. What church you pastor? First Assembly of God in Delphus, Ohio. Delphus, Ohio. Delphus. What brings you to revival? Well, I just came down here. The Lord told me if I come here, I'm going to get a gift from Him. And I believe I'm going to get it. Hallelujah. Yes, well, how many of you are from outside the country? Can I see your hand, please? Outside the country. Stand up. If you're from outside the country. Keep standing. Just for a moment. Now, naturally, I can't, we can't interview everybody from outside the country, but I want you to keep standing just for a moment. I want to find out where you folks are from. Where are you from? Come here just a moment. Okay, come here. Where are you from? Israel. How about that? Come right here. Well, what brings you? What brings you to Brownsville? He brought me to Brownsville. <laughs> no, I mean, um, we are on a tour of five weeks uh, over the in the states, and we heard there's a revival here, so we came to check it out. <laughs> Not to check it out, to receive from God. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. <laughs> right. What is your name? Arnie Klein. And your what's your name again? Arnie Klein. Arnie, I've heard that name. And do you pastor there in, uh, in Israel? Um, I've just been involved with planting a congregation with uh, friends we work with, Arian Shir Sokara. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we began that. And the Lord has begun to pour His Spirit out. 
and we're involved with uh, evangelistic activities and just a number of things. You ask from day to day what we do, and it's different. So, yeah. Well, it's good to have you folks with us. God bless you. Always miserable. Yes, sir. Hi. Well, you're a handsome fella. Where are you from? Cuba. From Cuba. Are all the fellas as handsome as you are in Cuba? No. I'll take that back. I've seen Fidel Castro. I'll take that back. <laughs> well, what's going on in Cuba, son? The church is growing a lot. Mm. God moving by his spirit? Yes, it is. Is there hunger in Cuba? Yes. The people are hungry for the word of God. Yeah. They're so thirsty. What do you hope to receive from the Lord here at this revival? Just, um, I came down here to get a fresh oil from the Lord. Yeah. Renew my strength every day. Yeah. Well, how long have, uh, did you just get in? Just, I've been here for four, four to five days now. Four, five, eight. How long can you stay? I got three months visa. Three months visa? That was a real miracle. Yeah. So, uh, by the time you leave here, man, you'll be sailing home. You, you won't even need an airplane to get home. You just, <laughs> God bless you. All right, where are you folks from? Jamaica. Jamaica. Wow, God bless you. All y'all from Jamaica? Well, what's going on in Jamaica? What's going on there? Yeah, are you having a good move of the Spirit? I think we're about to receive an awesome move of God, and I think God is preparing us. Today. You know, it seems like... <clears throat> Maybe we're just overly optimistic, but it seems like the whole world is getting ready for a major move of God, doesn't it? The whole world. God bless y'all. Good to have you. Okay, let's find out. Where are y'all from? U UK? United Kingdom? God bless you folks. Good to have you. Where are y'all from? Sweden. Well, man, talk to us. Do you pastor there? Uh, and I, I'm actually a missionary with Mercy Ships here in the States now, but I'm from Sweden. Yeah, is God moving in Sweden? Not as much as he should. He will. He will. I saw we had a big delegation up in the balcony a while ago. Y'all stand up again. Where, where are y'all from? Denmark. God bless you folks. Good to have you. God bless you. Where are you from? Germany. Denmark. Just hold your applause just for a moment. Yes. Denmark. Back here. Germany. Up here. South Africa. God bless you. Yes, sir. Where are you from? Britain. Canada. All right. Hey, brother, God bless you. Good to see you. Where are you folks from? France. This is your... Brother, you've been here several times, haven't you? You've been here several times, haven't you? That's yeah. <laughs> the fourth time. Yes. I can't tell you apart from Brownsville, folks. The more you've been here so much, brother. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, well, we are so hungry that uh, we just have to come back, you know. We want to have the fire of revival in Hamburg and Germany, too. God. Amen. Is God beginning to move in Germany? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I can tell when you come, I can see your face brighten more and more. The power of God's all over you. Yes. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. Where are you folks from? Okay. All right. All right. Where are you from? Norway. All of y'all from Norway? Well, what is going on in Norway? We have people here every week from Norway. What's going on there? Uh, the revival is starting to spread all over the country. And we are here to get more of the fire of God to a spiritual breakthrough in our country. Is God moving in, in all, all the churches there pretty well, different denominations? Or is it just mainly a particular church or a mainline denomination, or just all over? All over, all kind of de denominations. So your people are open in Norway for a move of God. They're hungry. More and more. God. Yeah. So That's great. God bless you. What you got here? I'll give you this from Norway, Pentecostal uh, uh, <laughs> magazine, yes. And uh, I will uh, give you an invitation to Norway. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Could I have this? Yes. Okay, thank you. What is your name? 
Oswald Instable. Well, I don't know about that, but I can tell you Pentecostal. I never heard tongues like that in my life. <laughs> Hi. I saw you folks sitting on the front row last night. Where are you from? Finland. You was interpreting for your wife last night. And uh, today, too. Today, too, yeah. Yes. Probably will be tonight, won't you? Yes. <laughs> God bless you. What's going on in Finland? Well, everything good. Revival. Praise God. You're having a good move of the spirit there. Yep. We are so thrilled every night when we come in here and see people from all over the world. We thank God for everybody that's here. But when you see people coming from all over the globe, and God is opening up revival now to people all over the globe, I believe that's a sign that we're living in the last days. How many of you believe Jesus is about to come? Where are you from? Where are you guys from? All you Denmark? Canada? Yeah. Where are you from? Canada? Back here. Australia? <laughs> I, always, I always love to hear from these Australians. You know Crocodile Dundee? You look like him. You talk like him, too. Let me, all y'all talk the same. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Say good day, mate. Good day, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, these are some friends from England. God bless you folks. Good to have you. They're from the west of London. West of London. All right, where are you folks from? New Zealand. Hey. Now, just for a moment... We want to take just a minute tonight, and I'd like to hear from about three pastors real quick. I want you to make it as quick as possible. But if God is moving in your church, if something is happening, and there's uh, something exciting going on in your ministry or your church, <clears throat> we want to hear what God's doing real quick. If Three pastors. Nah. Nah, I changed my mind. <laughs> well, man, you, you're a pretty heavy guy. You, you was running like lightning. God must be doing something. Where, where are you from? What's your name? Archer City, Texas. You remember me in the Cracker Barrel? My wife and I in February. I got to get a breath. <laughs> Thank you for your book. We were leaving. Yeah. And our daughter was in Teen Challenge, and we came down. Oh, for the yeah, yeah. Night. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> you said you got to stay for three nights. Yeah, I remember that. We did. Went back home, preached holiness. People are falling out in our church. Sinners are getting saved. church, one of those dead, dried up Assembly of God churches, <laughs> had eight people when I got there six years ago. Back in the early 50s, it was the biggest church in town, and then split 15 times. People that left that church back in the 70s, since I've been to revival here, starting showing back up in church. <laughs> <laughs> laid I laid hands. <laughs> I laid hands on all our elders and prayed for them. Now on Sunday morning, they come and lay hands on people, and they, people are falling down. People are getting healed. Things are happening. Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> I showed four videos. Four Brother, when the elders can lay hands on folks and they go out in the spirit, that's revival. Amen. I showed four of the videos, the Allison video and some testimonies from um, there. <laughs> Baptism. Yes, sir. And uh, <laughs> you're the pastor, right? You're the you're the pastor. Yes, sir. I'm the pastor of the Assembly of God. And uh, we just showed the videos, and then we started praying for people. On Sunday night, we've turned our service totally to praise and prayer. 
your book answered so many questions God was dealing with me about. I didn't realize that I was the bottleneck on what God was trying to do. And I was the pastor. And when I got out of God's way, things are breaking. <laughs> when I prayed through. Um, I thought we were doing real good until Steve Hill preached. That Sunday, Wednesday night, my wife was the first one that came up here, and I thought, what is she doing? And I'm standing here, do I go or not? I'm convicted, my heart's going, you know, like this. In 45 seconds, I couldn't get out of the pew. I had to kneel down back there and repent and for the compromise and being in God's way, and God honored it. And we're back. We drove all night Tuesday night and all day Wednesday to get here. I owe Brother Hill an apology. I couldn't help. I fell asleep the other night. <laughs> I'm sorry. Also, I'll tell you what, friend. You're blessed. There's 22 of us. Half of my board is here. Half of my praise team is here. In June, we're coming back. Stand up. Up there in the balcony. We're in the hey, all right. God bless you. Hey, I bet y'all didn't know your pastor could run like that, did you? I've been in Pentecost all my life, brother. You, you look like you had some Nikes on. No, I don't know what they are. When I was young and skinny, I used to preach and run all the time. I haven't, I haven't run like that in 20 years. <laughs> We're coming back in June with the other half of our board, the other half of our praise team. Our daughter will have been in Teen Challenge uh, for four months, and she gets a 24-hour pass. Guess where we're coming? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your book, for your love, and your compassion. And I want to say to all the people that work, thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to save you to laugh. Hey, what's your name? Chad Smith. Chad Smith, where are you from? Tacoa, Georgia. Tacoa? Yes, sir. Tacoa Falls. I used to eat catfish up there. Bless your heart. Yeah. Uh, Got to tell you what's going on. I'm an associate pastor first. Hoping you won't kick me off stage for that. Uh, we've had people. What church are you with? Tacoa Church of God. I first saw you and, and uh, Brother Lindell and Brother Steve uh, when y'all came up to Cleveland, yeah. Tennessee, with our renewal. Anyway, uh, some people came down here and bought some, well, there's videos going around everywhere up there. And the video, Honey, Where Are You From? And, uh, and uh, the guy, the black guy. When you, be when you become a pastor, you won't do that anymore. I hope not. I hope not. Uh, anyway. <laughs> That video has been going around, right? And um, they're back here, the Crawfords, anyway. They showed it in their house, and their son, you know, he's a real cool teenager. And he saw it, and he was just like the guy on the video. He says, Mom, I'm not sure about that. You know, I, I'm just, it's not cool enough for me to, and in five minutes, the, I, I get a phone call, and uh, it's his dad. He throws the phone down, and he's laughing in the spirit, and Bronson, which is the teenager, he's rolling around in the floor jerking just like the guy on the video was. The Holy Ghost hit him just like that in the home. Amen. That's not all. The mother's a Sunday school teacher, and she showed it in her Sunday school class, and everybody comes out of there with a the spirit on them and crying and interceding, and our, our church is just ready for a breakthrough. And anyway, uh, just here recently, we had another group come down here. Some t I'm the, over the youth, blah, blah. Uh, I'm trying to get there for you. Uh, they came down, and from uh, they came back mo Monday's our youth night service. And they were, you know, had the manifestation and jerking and hucking and bucking and, and all of us on them. And she came up and I let one of them testify. Well, we have a cheerleader who's all... You won't be using that kind of language when you become a pastor either, W. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, have a cheerleader who's all prim and primer and you know what I'm trying to say. And she saw the girl and she's like, she told her friend, she said, I'm really not sure if that's for real. She came to the altar that night uh, along with about 30 or 40 others. And she just asked God, God, if that's, if that's real, then I want you to do it to me. Don't do that if you uh, don't want that to happen. 
her hair, I mean, she was jerking and rolling. We carried her home, I had to get somebody on my staff to carry her home. Her parents, uh, first of all, were scared out of their mind. But now, the mom just testified, and she's not because of that, but because of what's happening in her daughter. She's wanting to be more like her daughter because of what the Spirit's doing on her. Amen. Amen for the youth people. Amen. God bless you. Hey, friend. God bless you. What's your name? Steve Lehman. <laughs> These are 25 leaders from a Chi Alpha group in uh, Eastern Michigan University. And uh, brought our leadership down here, doing it in the line. February 1st, we showed the Allison Ward video on a Sunday night. And it's usually about a 40 minute meeting. And uh, how our God fell. Six hours later, we went home. At Chi Alpha? Yes, sir. <laughs> and. Uh, Every Thursday night and Sunday night since then, with a break for a spring break, um, our meetings go three to six hours, and we've seen incredible healings and, uh, and miracles. But I'll tell you a couple quick things. Uh, we've got a lot of ministry to internationals, and uh, one gal who's from Indonesia, she's here tonight. Um, God was just uh, using our intercessors to really pray for her. Uh, she went down, and um, a gal who had just newly been baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, began to sing in tongues. And um, our Indonesian gal, she's been feeling called to go back to her own people as a missionary. And um, the gal who was singing in tongues was singing in a provincial language of Indonesia, singing a provincial uh, national song as a confirmation. And uh, big guy. Say that. Say that one more time. <clears throat> the, Say that one more time. The gal was singing a song that is one of the provincial songs of one of the provinces of Indonesia in that language. She just has been baptized in the spirit a week, a week and a half before. And uh, we just know that God, when God sent me there a few years ago, I've been there five, eight years, and eight years, and God uh, told me it was going to be a sending campus. And we believe that God's brought the nations to us and go back out. And so we're pumped, man. We're just excited. <laughs> That's great. God bless you, man. God bless you. Hey, how are you? What's your name? Where are you from? Dominic Russo, and I'm from Oakland County, Michigan. Michigan. Yes, I am. You're a pastor? Yes, I am. What, what church you pastor? Oakland Christian Church. Great. Oakland Christian Church in Oakland County. You sailed down here a while ago. What, what, what's, what's going on in the soy siding? Well, we are blessed. About late 1980s, our church went through a great split, one of the largest churches in the Detroit metropolitan area. And out of ashes, God has brought a team of men and women that have stood the course. And um, we have just purchased 50, just under 50 acres of property. We have built a building that our church has with, been without a building for 25 years, and God has kept this ministry and these people together. And out of, out of ashes, God has brought together this night 20 of our key leaders, all my elders, all my staff, together with their wives, to be in this conference. Our doors open in about two or three weeks, and we came right before we opened our doors to say, God, touch us, fill us, and use us to change. Stand up. Stand up. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, like to I wanted his group to stand up. I'm sorry. Boy, y'all sure are a submissive crowd. Stand up. <laughs> you know, this is all your group. And they've been without a building for 25 years. 25 years. You know what? I guarantee you, God is going to move in your church. And I guarantee he's going to move in that place, that new building. And I'll tell you why. Because of you. You're hungry for God. And you hadn't got no religion on you. I can tell that. And the, you can mark it down. God's going to touch your church. He's going to touch your ministry. He's going to move mightily. Hallelujah. What else? Praise God. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, my youth pastor and I came down in here in December. And I want to echo what the first pastor said. When I came in here, because sometimes you come to a lot of conferences and you see a lot of things and you see a lot of professional people that are full of glitz and full of glamour and full of glitter. When I came to this church, I saw real people. I saw your people. I said, our people are just like your people. 
And if it happened in Brownsville, it can happen with ordinary people in Oakland County. And I want to say to all your, all your people again, you guys are wonderful. We see the simplicity of Jesus Christ and the love of God that flows through your people. And you've made a difference in my life. And we're going to take ordinary people in Oakland County and see God's love and God's power flow through ordinary people to do a great work. I'll say this. My heart, my heart has always gone out to churches that's had problems and trouble. And here's a church that hadn't had a building for 25 years. I want everybody to stand and raise your hands toward these people. Half of you raise your hands toward the pastor up here, and half of you raise your hands toward those people. Let's bless them. Father, pour out your spirit in Michigan. Jesus in Michigan. Pour out your spirit, Holy Ghost. Give them miracles and signs and wonders. Draw, Lord, people to that place like a magnet of your spirit. How many of you out there in the audience wants revival in your church? Let's pray. Lift up your hands. Holy Ghost. Woo! Sin revival. Sin revival, Lord. Sin revival, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. You're in a silver Mazda for the Texas plates. Your lights are on. Be sure to take care of that. Your, your silver Mazda with Texas plates.
I feel such an urgency in my heart to begin praying with folks. And um, we're going to do that in just a minute. But um, for those of you that weren't here last night, there's something happening that is, um, it's, it's like the Lord is turning up the heat, the river's rising, the power's stronger. And uh, we've seen this in this revival. There's just like phases. And as you're obedient to what the Lord has given you with what you have now, we have seen a steady increase. And last night praying with people, and the pastor's conference last week was just a, just a sign of things to come. Let me tell you something. Everyone look this way, and those of you from other areas of the world, those of you that are praying for revival in your city, see, you're praying according to God's will. He wants your city to be saved. So you're in, you're in fellowship with God. You're in, you're, you're in agreement with God. He, he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants your city to be saved. So you don't have to ever, you don't have to ever uh, question that. Is whether your revival praying is of God or it's not of God. It's of God. God wants revival. He wants to do that, friend. But we're seeing an increase in the anointing. And if you're a pastor, a co-worker, a minister of music, or any line of ministry at all, be prayed for, friend. There's something happening. There's something powerful happening. We haven't seen anything. We're praying that God would break out in churches in America that would dwarf anything we've seen at Brownsville. And I, and I say that from the bottom of my heart. It would be so incredible to hear of God moving in other places. We're hearing it. But for God to move in your church, Pastor, and we already have churches. We've got churches here represented tonight where people are coming from other areas of the world, visiting their church. And many of you have heard of some of the churches in Missouri and other places of the country where God is moving and people are just coming in from other states and other nations. God's moving. Expect God to do it, friend. Believe him. Everyone pray with me right now. I want you to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day of 1995. We've been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Before we do this, I want everyone to look at me. Look this way. We're going to pray God speak to my heart and change my life. Many of you last night that were here, I cut short the altar call. I've never done that in my life. In the history of this revival, I cut it in the middle of Charity's song and told no one to come forward after that. And I spoke on the jailer, Paul and Silas, and how the jailer ran in. He sprang forward and he called for the lights and he fell down in front of Paul and Silas and he just, he humbled himself. It was an immediate action. And last night was a night where you got right with God quickly. And many of you are here tonight, you didn't get right with God, and you're chomping at the bit. You're not going to miss it tonight. When I give this altar call, you're going to be the first one down here. But let me tell you something. This right here, people are getting right with God here. This is a key of a cabin of a woman that was here last week. She had been having a 10-year affair with her boss. This is the key to the cabin. She got right with God. She got just gloriously right with God in this place. This right here, this right here is an article of affection. This is a junk that the devil will give you. This is a ring that another lady came forward and got right with God that her lover gave her. We had another lady that came up and gave her a necklace that she had an affair with a man, and now she was, she, she was, she was married at the time she was having this affair. She's in the ministry. And the man gave her this necklace, and she would wear the necklace to church. And she fell under conviction in this revival, got right with God, got the whole thing straight. Friend, when we pray this prayer, speak to my heart, change my life. God's talking about a seller search, not a spot search. I call it a seller search. That's when he goes down into the dungeon. And he's going to clean up your life. And you need to thank him for that. These people are living free now, friend, and you can too. Everyone pray with me right now. Everyone pray out loud. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Charity is going to come and sing in just a minute. 
run to the mercy seat, and I'll be honest with you tonight, friend, I have no idea where we're going with tonight's message. I have been, I've just been all day long, it's just... G, the word, the name Jesus has been churning over and over in my heart. There's so much power in his name. <laughs> Cecilia, where are you at? Wave at me, Cecilia. Right over there. How many years were you an alcoholic? 27 years? Let me ask you, when did you, uh, you came to the revival in February? February 12th, you remember the day. Did God deliver you from years of alcoholism? She said it's been mind-boggling since the day she got saved. She hasn't had one desire for a drink. Let me tell you something, friends, those of you that have been through secular therapy programs, and I'm not knocking programs. I believe in programs. If they work, great. But the bottom line is, there's a void in your heart. There's an emptiness there. Something's making you want to drink. Something's making you want to have an affair. Something is causing you to lust. Something is making you want to be greedy and mean, angry. Something that is causing all that, friend. And until you get to the root of the problem, you're never, ever going to get victory over it. Ever. And what's happening when I shared a few minutes ago about the crack addict that comes down here, God dealt with the root of the problem. He said, it's your, it's your relationship with me, son. It's not the crack cocaine. It's not dry up the country and get rid of all the drugs. It's get right with God. And the drugs will get rid of the country. I mean, if the country got right with God, the drugs would leave. The heroin plantations in Colombia and, and other areas of the world would dry up. They'd start growing cotton. Why? Because nobody in America wants drugs no more. They got right with God. So, those of you that said that you're hungry for God, and that's been made, that statement's been made several times tonight, and last night, are you hungry? I want you to listen. A man's desperation for the presence of God. If you say you're desperate, I want you to listen to this because some of you say you're hungry, and I'm telling you, you're not. You're not hungry. Some of you are like beggars that you'll meet on the streets. Dan Livingston, you're with us tonight, brother. Have you met some fake con artists on the streets in your life, brother? There was a man out in Dallas. We were just out in Dallas holding up a sign. And he said, it said, uh, we'll work for food. And you know what his sign underneath it said? Underneath, he said, who, are I, who am I trying to kid? I need money for alcohol. That's what he said on the sign. We'll work for food. Then he drew a line and he said, who, are, who am I trying to fool? I want money for alcohol. And that's, that's the bottom line with a lot of folks, friend. People say that they're hungry. You take a beggar on the streets. I remember meeting one here in Pensacola. And he said, man, I just got to have a meal. And I said, well, you know, I believe that, you know, rescue mission's feeding. He goes, well, I don't want to eat there. But we're like that as Christians. Feed me, Jesus. But this is what I want. And the Lord's not wanting to feed you that. He wants to feed you something different. And so you gripe and complain and you gag on what he's feeding you. A man's desperation for the presence of God. If you are hungry... It will melt all your preoccupation with self, notoriety, public image, and social status. It will melt, pastors, those of you from other countries, listen to me. You won't care. If you're hungry for God, you won't care what anybody thinks anymore. Your hunger and your thirst, if it's genuine, will drive you to eat and to drink regardless of the opinion of others. You will be willing to be a fool in the sight of your peers in order to be embraced in the arms of the Lord. You will be willing to be a fool in the sight of your peers in order to be embraced in the arms of the Lord. I want to tell you what's happening in America, friend. People don't care anymore what their neighbor thinks. That's why this revival is spreading so quickly. That's why our high schools are beside themselves in Pensacola here. 
We have people in our high schools that are hit by the power. We have, we have meetings, and it's amazing. The young people will come to these meetings. You heard this man testify of, of how people are being slain and they fall to the ground. And there are some critics in the house tonight, and I felt your criticism. When they said that, you go, ah, oh, what's that falling to the ground stuff? That doesn't prove anything. But don't miss what he said after that. He said, and the repenting of sin, they're getting right with God. Hello? God's getting their attention. The little daughter that shook violently, shook and shook, shook. What happened later? Holiness. Holiness. Now her mother wants to be like her because she's holy. Make sure you get the whole picture, person. Make sure you stand back and look at the whole thing. You, you might not like the method, but you can't argue with the results. I said that to say this. You might not like God's method tonight. He might take you out. Bring me that Washington Post. Do we still have that thing here? I shared this last night, but I didn't have the newspaper. Here it is. This is a, this is unbelievable, friend. This is the Washington Post. The title of the article is, What in God's Name? And it says, June 1995, Pensacola, Florida. One day church service turns into the longest, loudest religious revival in nearly a century. Now this is a, basically this man that's writing this article has no clue what's going on, but he knows something's going on. He said, it's still going strong. There's weeping and wailing, and bodies are thudding to the floor. He says, is this love, lunacy, or the beginning of the end of the world? But he talks in here, and I don't know where it is on this page. I knew where it was on my little notes the other day. But he talks about how folks, at the end of the night, this man stayed for several days. And he just watched. He was an observer, just watching, taking notes. He, I've never seen a man take notes so fast. He was un he just flipping that page, just, just forget the little microphone, the little recorders. This man could write it all down. And he stayed till 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and he watched people. And he watched the pastors walk out with their thumbs and begin praying for people, you know? I told my wife the other day when I read this article, I said, I don't pray for people. I don't put my thumbs on people. I put my, my fingers. She goes, you put your thumbs, hon. And I said, baby, I do not. She said, you do too. I work with you every night. I said, baby, I do not put my thumbs on people. Didn't I? The man's talking about John Kilpatrick's thumbs. He's not, he's not talking about my thumbs. And sure enough, last night when I was praying for folks, my thumb was on everybody's forehead. <laughs> so I'm telling you, that guy was watching. But it was interesting, he, did, he didn't say, and they were being pushed down. This guy's an, an outside observer. They're hit and thrown to the ground. And then he would stay till the end. And he'd watch people that could were immobile. And it says right here, um, Folks who have been slain, there's a picture here of the church. Folks who have been slain in the spirit fall to the carpet and twitch and tremble or lie still as corpses. <laughs> I want to tell you, if I, was, if I was in Washington and I read this, I would get a ticket to Pensacola in a heartbeat. But he watched people, and I'm saying this for a reason, because some of you are going, God, you can do anything you want, but. And he would stay to the end, and they would pick up these bodies, and it shares about it here. He'd watch them, you know. They'd pick up these bodies, these corpses, and they'd take them out, and they'd dump them out in the grass, like little babes, lay them out in the grass. And, and you imagine this reporter going, hmm. Just writing this all down, lying in the grass. And he just sat out there and waited, you know, the big full moon out there. And he goes, and they would come to under the moonlight <laughs> and stumble to their cars. And we've had men that never make it, men and women have never made it to their cars. As a matter of fact, one night, a man tried to make it out to his car and he fell in the parking lot, just out in the street. And he was, he was a hefty man and just totally limp. And they couldn't move them, so they took these big cones.
and they lined his body. <laughs> they lined his body with coals, you know, like a crime scene. Some of you are saying, that would never happen to me. A man's desperation for the presence of God will melt all his preoccupation with self, notoriety, public image, or social status. If you are hungry, if you are thirsty, you will say, Jesus, whatever you want to do with me, you can do it. You can do it. Hallelujah. Woo. Some of you are still reserved. You heard pastor say a few minutes ago, sir, the, the brother from Michigan, you ain't got any religion on you. Some of you didn't understand that statement because you're from, you're from a, a, an area or perhaps you've never, you've never understood the word religion. You think religion is Christianity and all good things that go along with God. Religion will damn your soul, friend. Religion... Religion is a choir robe on Sunday morning and living like the devil the rest of the week. That's religion. Religion is, 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 is a communion cup in your hand and a wafer being placed in your mouth and watching porno movies on Monday night. That's religion. You can go to hell with baptismal waters all over your face, friend. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand. That's religion. Do we believe in communion? Absolutely. Do we believe in choir robes? Absolutely. We believe in choirs, yeah. But friend, none of that will save you. But America has swallowed a lie, and so has Germany. So has Norway, Finland, into the Scandinavian countries. We, they come in here, they flock in here from Japan. Friend, I'm telling you, religion is not the answer. Relationship with Jesus Christ is the answer. That's the only answer. So... Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. Pastors, how many get frustrated around Christmas and Easter? Wait, raise your hand, pastors. How many get frustrated people that come to the cantatas and the Easter musicals and they never come back? It's, it's, uh, it's nauseating. It's nauseating. They'll show up and they'll sit there and some of them even weep because it's so touching. The little baby, you know, and maybe you'll have a children's choir singing a song away in the manger, and you'll have grown men out there sobbing like babies, but just as black and heathen as dark. I mean, they're in sin, living in sin. It's religion, friend. It's religion. Am I against cantatas? No. You've never heard me say that, but I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of We put on the best pageants in the world, this nation does. Nobody can do a, a, uh, a singing Christmas tree like we can in this nation. Man, we'll pile up the choir all the way to the chimney. There they are, and they'll sing all the, sing all the songs. It's wonderful. And the people walk out of there with just a little touch of religion on them. I had one lady say to me one night, I said, do you know the Lord? She goes, you know, I'm glad you said that. She said, because one day, about three years ago, I was in a church, and I looked up at the cross at the church, and I just felt so good. Then she stopped. And I said, ma'am, do you know the Lord? She had had a little religious experience, a little moment in her spiritual history where she got some goosebumps. I mean, and when she told everybody about it. She had a little revelation of the cross, but she never got saved. Friend, Look alive. Well, I want to talk about Jesus just for a minute. Many of you know that on October 28, 1975, I had a dramatic experience with the Lord. Some of you have read Little Stone Cold Hearts. We've handed out probably a million of those around the world. But I was saved dramatically on October 28, 1975. My life was supernaturally transformed. How many believe God can do that? The power of God came in and transformed this drug addict. I had an encounter at 11 a.m. with a living God. This transformation was so obvious that my own mother, who had watched me spiral into the cesspool of alcoholism and drugs, 
had seen me go from an adolescent child to a hardened criminal. In one moment, she watched me change. In the bedroom of our home, my mom watched my countenance change from being a rock hard, weather beaten by living years in sin, drug addict, into that of an innocent young boy. She watched the transformation. And it took place in about five minutes. She testified just the other day she was here in the revival as she looked into my eyes after my conversion and saw a totally different person. My conversion was a genuine article. I want to say that again. My conversion was a genuine article. How many believe you can genuinely get saved? It was a genuine article. Make sure, friend, your conversion experience was real. If someone says to you, you were saved back when you were eight at a children's service, but you don't remember any of it, you don't know anything that was going on, make it real. Make it real. Someone should not have to tell you when you were saved. You should know without a shadow of a doubt that you've had a life-changing conversion experience. How many know what I'm talking about? Sometime in your life, you had better had realized you were a sinner. I had been saved by crying out to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the healer of our bodies, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Alpha and Omega, the Holy One of Israel. I cried out to that name and the devils heard and trembled. I want to tell you tonight, friend, those of you that are in, going through some hard times, you can cry out at the top of your lungs in the name of Brownsville Assembly. Ain't nothing going to happen. You can say, in the name of the Pensacola Revival. Forget it, friend. You can say, devil, read my shirt. <laughs> yes, Lord, we will ride with you. Nothing's going to happen. You can look at the devil, put a snotty-looking sneer expression on your face, grab your list of denominations. Bring that to me, Charlie. I love my list of denominations. You can grab your list of denominations. I apologize because this list is 10 years old. It's probably double by now. But you can grab your list of denominations and say to the devil, I come to you in the authority of the corporate church. Devil! Read my list. <laughs> Read it and weep, Lucifer. I'm going to tell you, friend, ain't nothing going to happen. You can, you can start shouting out names of evangelists, pastors, and singers. You can say, listen up, devil, and all your demons. I come to you in the name of Jack Hayford. Billy Graham, Stephen Curtis Chapman. <laughs> DC Talk, Jars of Clay. Listen, Lucifer, I'm coming at you now with my bazooka. John Hagee, boo. He ain't budged. In the name of Stephen Hill, it'll never happen. In the name of John Kilpatrick, no way. In the name of Lyndall Cooley, you're wasting your time and your breath. But something begins to rumble. Yeah. Some 
something begins to rumble in the corridors of hell when you mention another name. The walls begin to quake and the demons shake when you say that name. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. being so excited there's still people here that have they ain't got it yet they don't understand I'm helping you out friend it's not a long name it's not like John D Rockefeller or Orville Redenbacher or Ralph Waldo Emerson those are all beautiful long names as a matter of fact it's quite short it's only got five letters those letters alone really don't carry a lot of weight by themselves. Even the first letter, J, is so common and unconvicting. We've heard of names like Jim, James, Jonathan, Jeffrey, Jason, and Jack, Judy, Jill, Jennifer. These names, the mention of these names don't cause the least bit of worry to the dark underworld. These names won't even register on hell's Richter scale. But, friend, there is a name above all names. A name, a name that when you begin to articulate it, it starts a chain reaction of fear throughout the kingdom of darkness. Like a flash flood, it sends the needle to the far right. It causes hell's Richter scale to peek out and fall from the table. It causes the devil's ears to point upward and his tail to stick straight out. And if he could, he would turn red. It's what happens when you put J-E-F-U-S together. It's the name of all names. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. There is no other name. Woo! Woo! It's the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! Glory! Glory! Hallelujah! It means Savior. It stands for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's feared in hell and adored in heaven. Oh, well, now I know what I'm preaching on tonight. Whew. We're just going to talk for a couple minutes about this man. He changed my life. You know, you just can't stop talking about that. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. I don't know what cranks your tractor, brother. <laughs> but I want to tell you, when you watch lives get changed night after night after night, nothing else matters. I can watch a person rejoice on television, read the publishing clearinghouse, and, and win $2.3 million, and watch them do somersaults all over the front yard, and just they look so happy. And I'm going, they ain't got a clue. They ain't got a clue. They, they don't have no idea what happiness is unless they're Christians. And if you are a Christian, you have won the publishing clearinghouse. My address is P.O. Box 2090. <laughs> we could use your money in our missions projects. You don't need a bigger TV. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and is being made in the likeness of men. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. The name which is above every name. I love history, friend, and I've studied some big, powerful people like Napoleon. Powerful people. Kingdom shakers. They're ants. Slugs. Pond slime. Gutter rats. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, some knees will bow. This is one of them promises you can claim, pastors. Every knee. I was in an antique shop. I was in an antique shop one day, and I'll never forget this. This intellectual snot was behind the counter. And I told him my testimony, how I'd been delivered from drugs. And he laughed at me, just laughed at me. He said, you fool. What an idiot. I can't believe you believe that junk. What a bunch of hogwash. Don't, I mean, he just railed into me, and I just stood there and listened to him, had a smile on my face, and he just could not believe anybody would believe in Jesus. And he said, you are so ignorant. You're such an idiot. And after he finished, I said, sir, I want to tell you something about your future. <laughs> I said, something's going to happen to you, and you're going to remember this little conversation we've had today. Because something's going to happen to you one day, either on this earth or on the great day of judgment. You, sir, and I pointed at his knees. I said, you are going to bend those knees, get on your face, and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. You're going to confess him one day. And he laughed at me, and I walked out of the shop. But you want to know something? One day, he's going to bow. Because the Bible doesn't say some. Every knee should bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that some tongues should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue. Mike, I need help tonight. Is there a theologian in the house, Mike? Let me ask you this question. I know you're probably weary of mine. But we need some help. Our Bible translation may be a little shady on this. The Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And at the name of Jesus, every tongue, every, and we're having a hard time understanding what does the word every mean in the original. Precisely, brother. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Pastor, you don't know what it's like having a theologian on board to help you out in hard times. <laughs> I call him about every day because we know I'll run sermons by him and stories and things like that. And it's amazing, friend, the simplicity of the gospel. Everybody's included in this. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, friend, I'm not going to preach from notes. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about my experience with him. And if you don't have an experience like this, friend, you need to have this experience. See, a testimony is the most powerful thing you can have. Pastor Kerry Robinson shared with you a few minutes ago. He said, you couldn't tell me that I didn't receive what I received. That's basically what he said. When you receive, friend, they can march 52,000 people in front of you and say it's a lie. You've received. I once was blind, but now I see. How do you tell a blind man he's not looking at you? That's impossible, friend. And he, you're the one that looks like an idiot. You're going, sky blue, trees green. And they're going, you ain't seeing. 
I watch these people that get delivered from drugs and narcotics night after night in this place. And then someone will have the, I don't know what to call it anymore. Two or three months down the road, somebody will say, yeah, they're not really being delivered. And these people are free, on fire for God, got jobs, supporting their family now. They quit drugs. Then a year goes by, they're still free, still supporting their family. A year and a half goes by, they're on fire for God. Now they're thinking about going into the ministry full time. Hello. And you're saying, well, that was just the devil. Sorry, friend, he ain't into that kind of work. The Bible says he comes to steal. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He doesn't come in to build up, restore, make better. That's the Lord's work. The Lord came and destroyed the works of the devil, and that's what happens night after night after night in this place. But I remember, I remember when I bowed my knee to the Lord Jesus. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Many of you can relate. You remember a time where maybe it was at a Brush Arbor meeting, maybe it was at a revival meeting back in the 50s or the 40s, or maybe it was just last week. You felt this. You fell under conviction. The Holy Ghost started dealing with your heart. And you knew even if you were an intellectual, you couldn't shake that feeling, man. Something's wrong. Something's wrong inside. We are inundated. Our staff is inundated with letters, just mounds of letters. The other day, the pie was this deep, one day's mail in the mailbox of people writing from all over the world. And almost every single one of them, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Changed, 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 delivered, delivered, delivered. And we just read them and weep. I look at them. I just love reading them. And you can't, there's not enough time in the day to read them all. The changed lives. These were encounters with Christ. On October 28, 1975, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'd been on drugs for a long time. I'd been running up drugs. I'd been smoking dope. I'd been stealing, doing a lot of crazy, idiotic things. I was caught up in the hippie movement. I was caught up in the drug scene. I was caught up in a rebellious lifestyle. And all my friends were like that. On October 25th, three days before an experience I had with God, on October 25th, I started going through convulsions. I was visiting my mom. I used to hitchhike all over the nation. And at this time, I was going through Huntsville, Alabama. And I was at my mom's house. And I was laying in a bedroom, lying in that bedroom. And my body started just being racked with convulsions. Just wild, wild convulsions. I broke out in hot and cold sweats. And I started screaming. I thought I was going to die. I started screaming out to my mom, Mom, come in here quick! She came in and she, she looked at me and started crying immediately because my, my body was just popping on the bed and sweat was pouring out everywhere. And then my, my, uh, my, I would scream out and say, Mom, I'm freezing! She'd cover me up with a blanket and then immediately I'd say, I'm burning up! And she'd put it on, take it off, wipe my forehead. This went on, friend, all day long. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. I'd, I'd seen things before. I'd gone through withdrawal symptoms before, but nothing was as bad as what I was going through. I know now what it was. I had given myself over to the demonic powers of this world. They had control of me, friend. There was absolutely no freedom. I remember lying on the bed, and the whole room began to spin out of control just began to spin. It was like a living nightmare. The walls were swelling. And those of you that have been on drugs, you know drugs can cause all kinds of hallucinations. They can cause all kinds of wild side effects. But I was not on drugs when this took place. This was the after effects of sin. This was just a result of living years and years and years away from God. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And that Saturday night, my mom went out to eat, and I called an ambulance. I called the ambulance service and told them to come get me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And they came, and they got me, and they, they put me into the back of the ambulance. They said, what's wrong? I said, there's something going on with me. And I was still shaking. I was still pouring out hot and cold sweats and, and, and just in agony. And they tried to understand what I was going through. But I want to tell you, friend, it was a spiritual thing. It was a spiritual thing. And I remember they took me to the hospital, and they put me in a padded room. And they brought a psychiatrist in there to talk to me. They, she sat me down. She said, now just listen to me, son. I can help you. 
And she said, you've been on drugs a long time, haven't you? I said, yes. And she said, what you need to do, what I'm going to do is prescribe to you a calmer drug. You don't need to be taking the drugs that you're taking, but I'll give you a sedative, and you can have this prescription, and you need these drugs. And I looked at her, and I went, you have no idea what I'm going through. I didn't need a drug. I'd done every drug in the book. In my library was a physician's desk reference. That's a PDR, we call it. That's where we looked up all the drugs we would steal out of pharmacies and veterinarian offices. We knew drugs. I knew them front and back. I knew everything about drugs. I didn't need drugs. And I told her that. I said, you don't know what I'm going through. And she got up to go get a needle to give me a shot. And as she got up, I ran out of the hospital. And I raced out on the highway, stuck my thumb out, and hitchhiked all the way back to the house about 10 miles. Went back in the house, and as soon as I laid down, the convulsion started hitting me again. And the devil came in, friend. Look at me, everybody. He will steal, kill, and destroy. Girls, don't fall for his lies. The devil will sneak into your life just like a guy will come in sweet-talking. He'll come in, he'll walk right up to you, ma'am, when you're 18 years of age, and he'll say, what's your name? You'll say, Judy, Judy, you're about the prettiest girl in school. You, could, I, could we meet together this afternoon and talk? Just out on the front steps of the school. And your heart's just pitter and patter because he's a hunk. You've heard rumors about this guy, that he runs around and hangs out with other women and he's taking a lot of them to bed, but you're, not, you're just going to choose not to believe that. Just like some of you heard rumors about the devil that he'll destroy, but you sort of set him aside. He kills people right and left. He's killing people all over America right now. Killing them. But you choose not to believe that. How many have heard this? It'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. So what do you do? You meet him out front. And he talks to you for a few minutes. And he keeps it. This guy's a smooth talker. How many have been around smooth talkers? He's a smooth talker. He knows how to talk. He goes, um, where you live? You give, it's all surface stuff. He knows just what to say. That's a pretty dress. You know, you look good in red. Then he says something like this, what are your hobbies? And you go, swimming? <laughs> Me too. I love to swim. We need to go swimming sometime. What else do you like? Volleyball. <laughs> Volleyball? Man, we need to play sometime. That's my favorite sport. Ever heard people like this? The devil's a con artist, friend. Before you know it, you're going home. You're sitting on the school bus going home going, man, we're just alike. You know, this may be it. This may be the one. I'm 18, about to graduate from school. This may be the one. Next day in school, he passes you a note. He says, Judy, I think I love you. You know, he's known you for eight hours. <laughs> I think I love you. And you're sitting there going, wow, this is too sudden. But, you know, I've heard of love at first sight. Maybe this is really the real McCoy. This is how sin creeps into your life, friend. How many folks here that drank a beer one day and said they'd never smoke pot? Smoke pot and you said you'd never run up heroin. Smoke pot and you said you'd never do this, you'd never do that. This is just how sin operates right here. The devil's creeping in to destroy and this is what he had done to me. Stay with me just for a minute, friend, because I'm going to tell you what happened. This little girl comes back to school on Monday and the guy's moving in for the kill. There's a Friday night football game coming up and he wants to take her out and afterwards he wants to go in the back seat of his car and have, have a party with her up on Lover's Leap somewhere. He's got it all planned out, but he's got a week to get her into the backseat of that car. And he takes that week, and by Tuesday, he's going steady with this girl. He said, and he's sitting down in the hallway, and he says something like this, you know, Judy, I've dated a lot of girls, but no one like you. You're different. You're different. You're special. You're special. And I just really think that we're going to make it together. I really do. Next thing you know, friend, he has sweet-talked you in the back seat of that car. And a common occurrence in America is the girl winds up pregnant. Where's um, Romeo? He won't even look at you. As a matter of fact, he calls you street gutter names in front of his friends. Spreads rumors around the school that you're an easy, you're easy game. You're an easy catch. And suddenly you become a school prostitute. And all you did was go out with this guy. 
and blow it. Friend, that's just how the devil is. He'll come in and he'll sweet talk you. He'll love on you. He'll say things like, you'll never get hurt, hooked. Everybody's doing it. He'll say this, he'll say that. And then you're just sort of weaseled into it, friend. Before long, he's got you in his grips. He's got you shackled. He's got you, friend. I'm, there's some good news in the end of this, so stay with me. Some of you right now are right in the pits of bondage. The marriages break up the same way. Everybody listen. You're having a bad day, sir, and you're at work. You had a spout with your wife. Matter of fact, you've had several blowouts with your wife over the last six months. Things just aren't that good at home. You just can't talk to your wife like you used to. So you're at work and some lady comes up and at the break room and just starts talking to you across the table and you enjoy her fellowship. You enjoy talking to her. You find yourself every day at that same table talking to her. Then you find yourself getting out of work and walking together down the hallway at work. Friend, I'm telling you how it happens. This is how it happens. The devil's moving in for the kill. He knows if he can get you two together, he'll destroy those kids. That kid that, that God had called to preach, who's nine years old back home, who loves his daddy, loves his daddy, but God called that kid to preach in children's church one day, and you, he came up to you, Daddy, and said, Daddy, I think I'm called to preach. And you said, Son, that would be the greatest honor in our family if you became a preacher but now he's about 11 years old and you're about to blow it big time and when he watches that because you're his idol you're his hero and he watches you and he hears rumors that daddy's going out at night with another woman his whole life comes crashing down and the devil goes ha, ha, ha another one bites the dust I've got him again not only that man and that woman I've got her family, I've got his family, I've got the wife, I've got the kids, I've got the neighbors. Friend, the devil is a sly fox. And here he had me on that bed, convulsing at the end of my life. Most of my friends were dead or in the penitentiary. My life was over. I knew it was over. And I remember Lucifer saying to me, he spoke into my, my spirit, I'll never forget it, friend, because I had learned Lucifer's voice. He had guided me all through my teen years. He said this to me, look at yourself, Steve. You're better off dead. Spirit of suicide. And here I was convulsing. Hot and cold sweats, breaking out all over, freezing, burning up, freezing, burning up. Thinking about my friends that were six feet under or others that were in the penitentiary. And I started contemplating suicide. And I want to tell you today, the only reason I didn't kill myself that day is because of my mother. My mama, now she had been praying for me, but my mama had already lost my dad when I was 16 years of age. She watched him die of a heart attack. And I had put her through hell on earth. And I knew that if I killed myself, she would die. I knew it would kill her. And I remember just holding on to that, that I would be responsible for the death of my mom. Her hands already, if my mom was here, she's coming back in about a month. If she was here, she would testify. Her hands, the skin on her hands, she could peel it off. Peel layers of skin off because of her nerves, because of me. She would lay in bed at night and whole layers of skin would just fall off her hands. Doctors that are here in the house, you know of those nervous conditions. Skin would just fall off her hands. She was so nervous. And she would pray for me all the time. Well... On October 28th, 1975, heaven turned mama's way. At 11 o'clock in the morning, three days after I broke into those convulsions, a knock came on my door, and a Lutheran vicar came in. Lutheran vicar is an associate pastor of a Lutheran church. He came in and he sat down next to me. And he grabbed my hand. And his hand began to tremble because I was violently shaking under the power of demonology, friend. I was demon-possessed. I know I was. And he looked into my eyes and he said, Stephen, I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. I'll never forget it, friend. 
I don't think I've ever met a man who spoke so clearly and so unashamedly and so direct, so dogmatic about what he believed. He said, I can't help you. It's a good line right there, pastors. I can't help you. Flesh and flesh, friend, it's just hard to do it. I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. He said, his name is Jesus, and he's in this room. And I was so gone, friend, I looked up around the room. And he goes, no, no, Steve. His spirit is here in this room, and he can change your life. And I looked up at him, and he still had my hand. And I said this, but I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. You know what he said? That's okay. He's still here. <laughs> then he said, then he said, pray with me. I said, but I don't know how to pray. And you know what he said? That's okay. You don't have to pray. This guy, friend, was, I call this moron level. He was bringing it down to the bottom. <laughs> I didn't have to pray. I didn't have to believe in God. He said this, Steve, just say the name Jesus. Just say the name Jesus. You know, I read a scripture a few minutes ago that um, it's powerful, friend. He's the, uh, that name Jesus is the name above all names. The Word of God also says that demons believe and tremble. And although I didn't know the power in that name, and I didn't realize what was about to happen to me and what's about to happen to hundreds of you in this room, I didn't realize it. I had faith somewhere in me that what that man was saying was true. I remember squeezing his hand, and I looked up at the ceiling of the room, and the ceiling was still swirling. The walls were still pulsating. I was still going through the sweats, the freezing, and the cold. And I squeezed his hand and looked up at the ceiling, and friend, I want to tell you, there was no religion on me. This was gut level. If you're out there, God, you're on the line. This was Elijah. The preacher was Elijah throwing water on the sacrifice. He's saying, Jesus, if you're out there, I boil it all down. This guy doesn't know the four spiritual laws. He doesn't know John 3, 16. He doesn't know anything. All I've said is to say your name, Jesus. Now you better move. And I squeezed his hand, looked up at the ceiling, and I began to say the name. I went, Jesus, 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 who? Jesus, Jesus. And the more I said his name, friend, something began to happen in that room. Something began to take place in that room. I said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I began to scream out his name. The wall stood still. The hot and cold sweats of shaking immediately left my body after three days of convulsions. My mama was standing outside the room listening. Her son saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I got louder and louder and louder and louder. And the more I said his name, friend, the more power came sweeping through this body. I'm telling you, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is healing. Woo. Boy, it's like it happened yesterday. Lord, I can feel this. Jesus, I love you so much. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the one. <laughs> You're the one that came into my soul. You're the one that cleansed me, Jesus. 20 years ago, 
You're the one, Jesus, that took away all the pain, all the suffering, all the misery, Lord. You took it away in seconds. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Friend, I'll never forget it. After about 30 seconds of praying, this is an in-depth prayer, all right? One word. After about 30 seconds, everything was brand new. I'm talking, friend. Now, you may think this is weird, but everything was brand new. I'm talking about the bedspread, <laughs> the dresser, the lamps, my skin. Everything was like through the eyes of a child. And I walked around with my mouth open, going, wow. I even said it backwards, wow. <laughs> Just, I couldn't believe it, friend. Everything was brand new, and I looked at the man, and I said, what's happened? Now, he didn't have to explain all the details, because I knew that, as far as my life had been changed. But he said, I don't really understand it all, Steve, but I think you've been born again. And I went outside, and I stared up at the sky. It was a beautiful October day in northern Alabama, gorgeous fall weather. And the breeze was just just licking across my face and it just everything was so fresh and crisp and I stood out there and I went sky now my neighbors had seen me doing stuff like this for years so <laughs> <laughs> nothing new to them I went sky you're so blue then I got on my knees and pulled up grass from the roots and I went it's so green it's so real. Have you ever seen a baby just playing clover? That's what I was like. Everything was brand new. Through my eyes, everything was brand new. Went inside, my mom had made a couple sandwiches. It was time for lunch. Her son had been dramatically transformed. She made some sandwiches and the vicar sat down and mom sat down and she said, well, who would like to say grace? And I went, I will. <laughs> I've been saved 30 minutes. And it was like, my mom looked at me like, dear God, is this possible? It is possible, friend. I had no intention of sharing this tonight, but somebody needed to hear it. You needed to hear it. I had no intentions. As a matter of fact, I was going to preach out of Romans 8, 28 tonight. But God has led in this direction, friend. And I'm going to close in just a minute. Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. But from that point on, friend, everything was different. Everything changed. And I learned in life the power in that name of Jesus. Young people, there's power there, friend. There's power. I remember in Argentina, and we're going to close, but listen to this. I was in Argentina, and this was before I learned Spanish. This is back in the early 84. And I was in Argentina holding a crusade. And about two or three hundred people came forward in that crusade. And, and this girl was standing in front of me, and it was obvious she was a witch. She was dressed, the costume, and she was into deep into witchcraft. She was a young girl, looked like she was 13 or 14 years old. And she looked at me, and she was just burning. There's a lot of demonology and witchcraft in Argentina. She just, she hated me. You could see it in her eyes. Her eyes were just wide open, staring me down. And I walked around, and I was praying with people, but I couldn't get that girl off my mind. And I went back over there, and, and I had an interpreter working with me. And when I walked back over there, my interpreter had been spending time with someone else and couldn't get away from the other person. So I was all alone walking around praying for these Argentines that didn't speak English. And I walked up to the girl, and I stared her in the eyes. And she just, you could tell she was about to lash out. I mean, she was wicked as they come. And I knew I was facing the devil. And I looked around for my interpreter. I couldn't find him. And I said, Jesus. I started talking to the Lord in English. I said, Jesus, what am I supposed to do? I need to talk to her. 
I need to find out where she's coming from, what she's into. And the Lord said, why? That's because then, Lord, I'll be able to talk to her and pray with her and, and lead her into your kingdom. He said, no, you don't need to do all that. He said, say my name. And he said to me, do you remember, Steve, how you got saved? Oh, yeah, I remember that, Jesus. I remember that. It was quick and to the point, wasn't it, Lord? He said, I can do the same thing in her. And I said, but Jesus, I don't even know how to say your name in Spanish. I had not even learned Jesus. I knew no Spanish. Matter of fact, I tried to practice the word hello, and I kept saying halo <laughs> instead of hola. I'd walk around going, halo. I was a tough cookie. And so I didn't even know how to say Jesus. So I looked the girl in the eyes. The Lord said, say my name. I looked her in the eyes. And I went, Jesus. And lightning hit that girl. She was thrown to the ground, began spitting up, foaming, kicking and screaming. And I stood there in amazement. <laughs> And I realized, devil, he knows every language in the world. He knows Jesus in Japan. He knows him in Germany. He knows, friend, when your name, when you name his name, when you name the name Jesus, the devil hears it. He knows it. He knows what authority is behind that name. And I watched that girl get delivered. She was set free that night. I mean, it took 30 minutes. They were just praying over her, casting out demons and devils one after another. And afterwards, she came up to me in, in her right mind, looked like a totally different person. I'll never forget that to this day, friend, the power in the name of Jesus. Don't ever forget that, pastors. Because I tell you, we've counseled them to death. We've counseled them. We street with those of you that are street evangelists. Don't ever forget the name of Jesus. You can have the greatest techniques to lead someone to God. Don't leave Jesus out of the picture. And don't be afraid to ride out on the streets. Take that person's hand and say, look at me. In the name of Jesus. In Argentina, we pray, in el nombre de Jesucristo de Nazaret, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because there's a lot of Jesuses down there. Jesus is a common Spanish name. You go, Jesus! Jesus, and 25 people raise their hands. <laughs> so we say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you know, we pinpoint him. That one, devil. Now, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, say that name with me right now. Jesus, say it again. Jesus, there is power in the name of in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. There's anointing in the name of Jesus. Woo! Yes, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, everyone stand. Everyone with the chairs moving to the left and the right. Everyone else stand. Those of you in the overflow rooms, I want you to stand. Those of you at home, stand up. Sir, get out of your lazy boy. And stand up. We're waiting on you. How anybody can watch a revival video or revival program with a bowl of popcorn <laughs> and a bottle of beer or a can of Pepsi, I'll never know. Put your popcorn away, wipe the sandwich off your face, and stand up. Yeah. Now tonight, the altar call may be quicker than last night. If you're going to get right with God, 
If you're going to get right with God, when charity begins singing, and run with, to the mercy seat, you come quickly. If there is sin in your life, you come quickly. If you're backslidden in this place, backslider, there's some sure signs to prove that you're backslidden. One of the sure signs is you've lost your spiritual appetite. You no longer go after God. You're backslidden. A sure sign is that little things, little sins don't bother you anymore. Of course, there's really no little sins and big sins. But they don't bother you anymore. You can sit in front of a television set and watch two individuals slip their clothes off and hop into bed. You can watch that. No remorse. It doesn't grieve you. You're backslidden, friend. Jesus would never sit there and watch that with you. And you've used the excuse, well, it's not that bad. It's just a sitcom. It's not that bad. It's just a, it's just a minor program. It's, it's not that bad. At least I'm not into triple X-rated porno movies down at the slut shops. It is that bad, friend. Are you listening? It is that bad. It's an abomination in God's sight. Jesus said, if you think it in your heart. So backslider, you're doing things that Jesus would never do. That's what sin is. Anything that Jesus wouldn't do. You're fantasizing over another woman or another man. You're a backslider. A backslider is someone who at one time in their life knew Jesus, but now they've grown cold and dry. You've grown worldly in your actions and desires. Pastors, you know what backsliders are. You see them all the time. At one time, they're on fire in your church. They wanted to lead songs. They wanted to place all the hymnals in the little slots behind the pews. They would do anything because they were on fire for God. But now they're backslidden. Haven't seen them for a few weeks, have you? Then you run into them at the mall, and they try to avoid you. And then finally, when you do catch up to them, you go, Bill, Bill, where you been, man? Haven't seen you. Oh, pastor, listen, I have been so busy with work. It's interesting that he hasn't really changed jobs. He had the same jobs he had before. And before, he had all the time in the world to come to your services, do everything. He was always there. He made time for the services. But now, suddenly work is more important. He's grown so worldly in his actions and desires. Friend, you're backslid. Let me tell you something else, backslider. This ain't no time to backslide. This is 1997. We're fixing, a, we're racing towards the end of a millennium. The world is like a time bomb ticking right now. Tick, 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 tick. Economists are spooked. Ecologists are spooked. Politicians know something is going on on the world globe. There's wars and rumors of wars everywhere. People know prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Go into any Walmart and watch them scan your items. Wake up, backslider. They've already got the automatic debit cards. They already want to take the money automatically out of your account. That'll eliminate checks, eliminate coins. Within a year, you can slide your debit card into a Coke machine and get a Coke. You'll be able to buy anything with your debit card. But you'll get tired of carrying the piece of plastic. You don't want to take it to the beach. It's cumbersome. It gets in your way. They'll say, no need to. Because if you just come by the doctor's office, he'll touch your hand and we'll put a chip in your hand. And you can go to Walmart, buy anything you want, and that's your debit number. It's also your social security number. It's also a tracking device. Think of that, sir. Your family will know where you are. Anywhere in the world, they'll know where you are. Every parent will get one for his child. Your child can never be kidnapped. They'll track the child wherever the child's abducted. They'll know exactly where the child was abducted. And if the kidnappers don't know how to, to, how to, to ward off the signal, they'll be able to watch the kidnapper's car driving down the road. They'll be able to zoom in on him right where he's at. The other day, my wife and I were in Atlanta, and we rented an automobile with a tracking Many of you have seen those systems where it's, uh, you can poke in the address of where you're going. And Atlanta's three, four million people. 
I didn't want to look at a map. So we had this global tracking system. We put Atlanta, Georgia on there, and we put Peachtree Street and the address of the, the restaurant. And the, the, the speaker says, go forward one half mile. I went one half mile. Turn right at the next light. Turn right. Three miles ahead. We went three miles. Take a left at the next light. Peachtree Street. Take a right. And then it would flash. Destination ahead. Destination ahead. Want to go back to the hotel? We could drive anywhere in Atlanta. Just poke the thing in, and it takes you straight back to the hotel. Don't even have to think. Don't even have to think. Wake up, friend. That's hooked up to a satellite. Technology is right on us. For them implanting the chip in your hand, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark. Walk into Walmart with an automatic debit card one day, they'll go, that's archaic. We used those back in 1999. If you don't have the mark, you can't buy groceries here. This is the way everyone does business. Friend, wake up. I get most of my information from bankers, secular bankers. They're the ones that'll tell you what's happening. You don't have to read about the mark of the beast in the Bible. It's right, on, right in front of us. It's right here. But you're backslidden. Of all the days to live for God, it's today. The beast is right at our doorstep. The Antichrist is prepared. Everything is going to happen any day now, friends. I believe we're right at the verge. The closing of the curtain, and you're in sin. Dear God, what on earth are you thinking about? Let me ask you a question. If somehow we could all board a jetliner, some of you still don't realize how bad off you are. Let's imagine together that we were able to all board a seven, I think they're coming out with 777s now. But if Boeing keeps going the way they are, I think they've joined up with McDonnell Douglas and they're making bigger, better planes. And if they keep going the way they're going, they're going to be able to make planes that can house thousands of people. I can imagine a plane handling a thousand within the next few years. But let's imagine a plane that can hold this crowd in this church. We all get on the plane at the tarmac of Pensacola Airport. We take off to California, every one of us. We're flying over New Mexico, and you look out the right window, and, and smoke starts shooting out of the jet engine, and fire comes out, and then it just kicks off. It's over. It's no longer operating. The pilot comes over the intercom system. Everybody's freaking out. They're in panic. The pilot comes over the system and says, ladies and gentlemen, there is no need to panic. We have everything under control. I have radiated. I have Albuquerque, New Mexico. They have cleared the runway to land. Please, ladies and gentlemen, there may be some turbulence, so get into your crash position. So you take your head, you put it between your legs. You've already been through all that. You know exactly what to do. About that time, do you hear an explosion? You get your head out from between your legs. You look off to the left. The left jet engine has exploded. Everyone knows it's over. Within a few seconds, the jetliner that was racing towards the Albuquerque airport is now nose down, barreling towards judgment. You look out the window and you see the farmland that was patchwork like a quilt. It's coming at you at breakneck speed. You know you have a few seconds and it's over. Everyone knows they're going to die. We know that much about plane crashes that no one's going to survive that crash. At 40,000 feet, you're barreling towards the earth. There's no stopping you. Would you, in a situation like that, repent or worship? If you were about to die, would you go, Jesus, God, forgive me for all the things that I've done wrong. Forgive me, Lord, for the lustful thoughts, for those things that are in my mind, the stuff I've watched on television. Jesus, forgive me for my lukewarm attitude. Lord, forgive me for my, uh, I've been such a religious hypocrite. Lord, forgive me, wash me clean, or would you go? Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm coming home. It happens every day all over the world. Into thy hands I commit my spirit, Jesus. We've had people saved in this revival and have died on the way home. 
We've had people saved in this revival. You listen to friend? They've died. They've gotten saved right here. This is urgent, friend. I'm asking you, would you repent? If you're saying right now to me, I'd have to get right with God, then this is a place to get right with God right here. Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. When she does, everyone that has sin in their life, everyone who's away from God, I've talked to you about Jesus tonight, friend. He will wash you clean. He'll take every sin in you. He'll wash it from you. He'll cleanse you. Friend, he died for the sins of the world. He will make you brand new tonight, but you're going to have to step out. He already stepped out. He came down from heaven 2,000 years ago. It's time for you to step out and come to him. He came to you. Now it's you, time for you to go to him. Those of you that are backslidden, you're going to come in just a minute get right with God. Those of you in this room that are religious, but you don't know him, you know all about him, but you don't know him, I thank God that this Lutheran vicar knew him. Thank God that that Lutheran vicar didn't turn to me and say, Steve, you've got to come to communion. You've got to come to our church services this Sunday. Thank God he didn't even mention that. He said, Steve, he's here. Religious person, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Is he everything to you? Are you white hot? If you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out of his mouth. If you are cold, you're going to hell, period. So there's only one temperature, and that's hot. And if you're not hot, these altars are for you tonight. That means white hot for Jesus. You're not ashamed of the gospel. You're living for God. You're bold. You can talk to people about Jesus with your head up. You're white hot. You're on fire for God. Those of you that are religious, don't tell me about him. I want to know, do you know him? And one last thing tonight, those of you that have never known the Lord, I shared with you tonight about a man named Steve Hill who never knew the Lord. And that man who came to my bedroom did not explain to me who Jesus was. He just said, he's here. And if you'll call out to him, he'll change your life, Steve. I'm saying that to every one of you. The other day we had 10 Muslims saved right here. We had a, a, a girl, a Mormon girl saved. We have drug addicts. You name it, they come down to these altars. Intellectuals, millionaires. One pastor came to the other day and he said, Steve, the son of a billionaire got saved in your church the other day. The father came down, was in your revival for two days, went back, flew back up, got his son who was a drug addict, a billionaire. Brought the kid down here. He was saved right here. Miraculously transformed. Brilliant. And it is an, isn't it amazing, friend? Isn't it amazing that your parents can have billions of dollars and you can go to hell? You know? Money don't cut it, friend. Intellect doesn't cut it. You need to come down here and get, get right with Jesus. Every knee's going to bow. Everyone in this room, one day you're going to do this. You might as well do it now. One day you're going to do it. You might as well take care of business now. One last thing before we pray, those of you that know you're not supposed to be down here, you know there's sin in your life, but you don't want to come down here because of pride. That's all that is, friend, is that's pride. It's a damnable characteristic. It's what cast Lucifer out of heaven. He said, I will become like the Most High. I want to be like God. Pride, friend, and, and the devil, he'll come up to you tonight, and he'll agree with me. He'll say, the preacher's right. He is right. But why don't you go home and talk to God about it? Why don't you get right tomorrow? Tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar, friend. You ain't got tomorrow. And the devil will say, you don't need to go down there. What are your mother going to think? What's your husband going to think? What's your girlfriend going to think? What's your daughter going to think? What are your friends going to think? Friend, everyone look at me. What does God think? That's the only question you need to ask. Does God want me down there? And if God wants you down here, friend, you better obey him. Because if you think you're going to go back to your hotel room or those of you from Pensacola are going to drive back home or Mississippi going to drive back home tonight and get alone with God in your bedroom, turn on some Lyndall Cooley mu music, some Brownsville music and get the Lord in your room and just worship God and get the presence of God in there and, and then fall on your face and confess sin, I'm telling you tonight, the heavens will be brass. I want to tell you why. Because you were ashamed today. You were ashamed at the Brownsville revival. And I can hear the Lord saying to you, what are you doing? You want me to forgive you right now. 
in the secret of your bedroom. I want you to understand something, ma'am. I want you to understand something, sir. My son was crucified 2,000 years ago for you. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was kicked. He was spat upon. He was cursed. He was nailed to the cross. His clothes were stripped from him. He was put naked on the cross, hands nailed, feet nailed, hung on top of Mount Calvary for you, for everyone to look at, a human spectacle for people to jeer at and laugh at. For you, not behind Mount Calvary, on top of Mount Calvary. He did that for you, and now you're here in your little secret bedroom praying to him when he did everything public for you. Jesus died publicly for you, and you couldn't have walked 25 feet and gotten right with him. Think about it, friend, and go ahead and get mad at me now if you want to. We'll all stand before God and take your mad, angry statements to God one day and say you got mad at the evangelist because he wanted you to come forward. What do you think God's going to say to that? Oh, he wanted you to go down there and repent of your sins. He's going to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to look at you and say, rebellious one. There's rebellion in your heart, pride in your heart. You're not humble. You wouldn't break before me. And now you want me to, end, now you want me to say, enter in. Friend, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Right now, these altars are going to open. Everyone that's got sin in their life, everyone who's away from Jesus, everyone who is backslid, do not hesitate. I want you to come right now and get on your knees. Hurry right now. Hurry. Charity, sing this with all your might. Come on right now. I need the Lord. Hurry. Hurry in the balcony. Let's go. In the balcony. Let's go. Come on. Hurry. In the darkness, hurry. 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 Everything is unknown. Come on. Come on. I Let's face go. the power Let's go. of sin on my you. own. Hurry. I did not know of a place I could go where I Hurry. could find a way Hurry. to heal my Hurry. wounded soul. Hurry. Hurry. God bless you. God bless you. Usher's help He us. said that I could come into come his presence without fear. Let's go. What are you to on? the holy place where well, mercy well, hovers near. Hurry, hurry, I'm hurry. running, Come I'm on. running, Come on. I'm running to the, the mercy seat where Lord. Jesus is calling. He said his grace hurry. will cover God bless me, you. his blood God bless will you. flow free. Come on. It Come will on. provide the healing. We're waiting on you, I'm friend. running to the mercy seat. I'm running to Hurry. the mercy seat. Hurry. Hurry, God bless you. God Lord, bless you. Lord, have mercy. Come on. 
Yes. Everyone at this altar, I want you to keep your heads down. Everyone at the altar, do not move. Stay right here at this altar. Lindell, we're going to sing a couple times through.